Hello, I'm Keith Cooperschmidt, the CEO of the Copyright Alliance. I want to welcome you all to the CCB series of the Copyright Alliance's Copyright Academy. In this series, the Copyright Alliance staff take an in-depth look into the processes and procedures of the Copyright Claims Board, or CCB for short, in order to help creators who are looking to understand more about the CCB. Now, hopefully you have already reviewed the educational materials on the CCB that are available on our website and watched our other Copyright Academy videos in the CCB series, especially the video on filing a claim with the CCB. If you have, then you should be generally familiar with the start of the CCB process and the names of the parties. But if you haven't watched the videos on filing a claim, you may want to do that before watching this video, as I think you'll find it very helpful. Today, we will be talking about what happens after a claimant successfully files a claim with the CCB and the case becomes what's called an active proceeding. So today, we'll be talking about what you need to know about active proceedings. And to speak about these issues, we, we have with us here today, Terika Carrington, who is the Vice President of Legal Policy and Copyright Counsel at the Copyright Alliance. So welcome, Terika. Let's start. Uh, so Terika, let's start with the basics. Uh, what do you mean when we refer to a case as active? After a respondent is served notice of a case, they have 60 days to decide whether to participate in the case. Once that 60-day window closes without an opt-out, the case then becomes active. That means that both parties have decided to participate and the case is moving forward. So after the opt-out period expires and the case becomes active, Terika, what happens after that? Once a case becomes active, the board will issue an order to all the parties requiring two things. Number one, the claimant must pay the remaining $60 of the filing fee. If you recall from the video on filing a claim with the CCB, the claimant pays the first part of the filing fee when they file their claim. That portion is $40. And once the case becomes active, they then pay the remaining $60. So the order will instruct the claimant to go ahead and pay that $60. And number two, the order will require all of the parties to register for the ECCB, which is the Online Filing and Case Management System. This is where the parties will file their materials related to the case and receive any communications from the CCB. The parties will have 14 days to complete these requirements. All right, so the claimant pays the additional $60 and the parties all register for the ECCB. That, that seems to make sense. So what then, what, what happens after that? After the claimant pays the additional $60 and the parties register for the ECCB, the board will lay out the schedule for the case in what's called the scheduling order. All right, so the scheduling order seems to be a very, very important because it provides a sort of roadmap for what the parties can expect going forward in an active proceeding. Once it's been issued, can the scheduling order change for any reason? Because I think that'd be pretty important. So yes, the board has the ability to amend the scheduling order when necessary. So for example, if a respondent brings a counterclaim and that counterclaim is approved, or if there are conferences or hearings added to the schedule, the scheduling order would need to be amended to account for those changes. The board can also amend the scheduling order if it becomes necessary in order to properly manage their docket. And the parties can also request a change to the schedule. All right, so this is very helpful. Um, can you walk us through what claimants and respondents can expect to happen as the case moves forward? Sure, uh, the easiest way to think about a proceeding is in three stages. Number one, pre-discovery, number two, discovery, and number three, post-discovery. And I'm happy to go into more detail about each of those. All right, so let's start with the pre-discovery stage then. Uh, can you let everyone know what to expect in the pre-discovery stage? During the pre-discovery stage, the respondent will file a response to the claims raised by the claimant. This is the respondent's opportunity to dispute the facts alleged by the claimant and to raise any defenses and permissible counterclaims. The CCB provides a form that helps to simplify the process of drafting a response. And the respondent will generally have 30 days from the day the scheduling order is, the scheduling order is issued to submit their response. And if the respondent does choose to file a counterclaim, the claimant will have 30 days from when the counterclaim is approved to file a response disputing the facts alleged in the counterclaim and to raise any defenses. Finally, one of the CCB officers will hold a pre-discovery conference with the parties to discuss case management, the discovery process, and the possibility of resolving the dispute through a settlement. And after the pre-discovery stage is the discovery stage. 
So what is discovery? And then maybe you can explain what happens during the discovery stage. Well, discovery is the process where each party has the opportunity to gather certain information and evidence from the other party to help support their arguments in the case. So during the discovery stage, the parties will generally exchange information by responding to what are known as interrogatories, which are questions relevant to the claims or counterclaims in the case, and by exchanging relevant documents. Parties can also request that the board permit additional discovery, but that request will only be granted in limited circumstances. And the scheduling order specifies the timeline for when discovery will happen and all of the de- all of the relevant deadlines. Now, discovery also takes place during a federal court case. How does discovery at the CCB differ from a federal court uh, case? The discovery stage of the CCB differs from federal court in a few ways. So, for example, it's much more limited than in federal court. Some forms of discovery that are allowed in federal court are not allowed at the CCB or may only be allowed under special circumstances. So for example, depositions are not allowed at the CCB and requests for admissions are generally not allowed. Another way the CCB differs is that the board provides the parties with a standard set of interrogatories and document requests so that the parties don't have to worry about creating them on their own. Uh, The last of the three stages you referred to is the the post-discovery stage. Now, what happens in that final stage of the process? During the post-discovery stage, a CCB officer will hold a post-discovery conference with the parties. This conference is similar to the conference held during the pre-discovery stage. It will cover case management, the discovery process, and the possibility of resolving the dispute through a settlement. The parties will also file their written testimony and responses during this stage, and the CCB officers will, will review everything and reach a determination about how to resolve the dispute. So you have walked us through each of the three stages, but I have some follow-up questions to make sure our listeners better understand the process. The first thing people may want to know is whether any of this must be done in person. That's a really great question. So no, actually everything is done remotely. There are no in-person appearances before the CCB. Uh, Will proceedings before the CCB involve hearings? If the board deems it necessary, a hearing may be scheduled during a proceeding. Parties can also request a hearing and the board will consider that request and make a decision. And like everything else in a CCB proceeding, any hearings would be held virtually. So what about if there are witnesses? Are witnesses allowed to participate in the CCB proceedings either for the claimant or the respondent? Witnesses are allowed to participate in CCB proceedings. If a witness has personal knowledge about the facts of the case, a party can submit a written statement from that witness. Expert witnesses, on the other hand, Those who do not have personal knowledge about the facts of the case, but may have expertise or specialized knowledge on a subject important to the case are generally not allowed to participate in a CCB proceeding. The board will only grant a party's request to use an expert witness in exceptional circumstances. What happens if a claimant or respondent stops participating in an active case? If a claimant stops participating in an active case, the CCB may dismiss their claims for failure to prosecute, and they may be required to pay the uh, attorney's fees and costs of the other party. If a respondent stops participating, the case will go on without their participation. The board will consider evidence submitted by the claimant to make a determination about the case while still leaving open the opportunity for the respondent to show back up and participate. If the CCB determines that the evidence supports a ruling in favor of the claimant, they will issue what's called a default determination in favor of the claimant. If they determine that the evidence does not support a ruling in favor of the claimant, the case will be dismissed. So let's assume the parties and the CCB have completed all three steps. Uh, Once the board has all of the testimony and conducts any hearings that it needs to, how are the cases ultimately decided? CCB officers consider all of the testimony and evidence that was presented to make a determination. Determinations have to be agreed to by a majority of the CCB officers presiding over the case. The officers have to follow existing judicial precedent from federal court, meaning that they are to resolve matters in the same way that a federal court judge would resolve the issue. In the rare instance where there might be conflicting precedent, meaning that courts differ on how to resolve a certain issue, the officers must follow the law established by the court where the claim could have been heard if it had been brought in federal court. Well, thanks, Terika. We've covered a lot of ground here. Hopefully, after watching this video, 
claimants and respondents will have a better idea of what to expect in an active proceeding. But the, in the event you're watching this video and still have some unanswered questions, you should go to the Copper Alliance's CCB Explained page on our website or call our hotline uh, at 888-5403-CCB. Once again, that's 888-5403-CCB to get more information about the CCB and the CCB process. And of course, you can also check out the numerous resources the Copyright Office provides on its website at ccb.gov. Thanks again for watching.